I, we always like to start these nights with a question. So how many of you are here for the first time tonight? Oh, please help me in welcoming these new folks. For all of you newbies in the audience, here's how it works. We are not a secret society. <laughs> now that you are here, you are automatically in on all the secrets, and this is the first one you need to know. We are not professionals. <laughs> Our speakers by design are sometimes experts and often are enthusiastic amateurs. So I wanna encourage you to be generous in your applause for everyone up on this stage. in no small part because they are doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. Everybody here works for booze and books and the glory of your appreciation. The same can be said for our dear volunteers at the door in the merch table, our beloved Steen, and our team of partners that put each one of these nights together. And since not one of our speakers has ever gotten paid real cash money for the effort they put into our talk, historically, on occasion, from time to time, folks have gotten a little bit squiffy about deadlines. <laughs> and so long ago, when we were very first getting started with this thing called Absalon, a policy was put into effect that if you didn't get your material to the curator in a timely fashion, they could, by all rights, put you on stage with a slideshow full of cats. <laughs> but as far as I know, this promise or a threat has never been realized. And I figured with a theme like Explore, I could try anything and it would totally be on brand. <laughs> and so in the name of exploration and experimentation, I've decided to explore some brand new territory and the first time ever on the Atalon stage, as far as I know, you're getting a slideshow full of cats. <laughs> you're welcome. So here we go. Now, for those of you new to this audience, you should know that this is not generally a quiet event. <laughs> People hoot and holler, and sometimes at designated times, and sometimes for the sheer joy of having the cleverest line in the room. I think of it as friendly heckling. So if your neighbor here in the room has had enough cocktail to get involved in the hollering, please don't shut them down. <laughs> Instead, know that it's totally encouraged to make some noise and let your speakers know that you are totally with them. <laughs> now, in particular, there are a few occasions when yelling at the stage is very much expected, so regulars, please help me out here. or cats or art, there's no right answer here. Just get in on the fun. Uh, if you happen to be an introvert and would prefer to revel in the joy of having the cleverest line on the Twittersphere, we invite you to turn your attention to our social medias. That's totally fine too. In other words, there is no need to put away your phone and sit calmly and politely tonight. That's not us. <laughs> Perfect. And there are even more ways to play because this project is participatory by design. By being here, you all are all invited not only to join the not secreted society, but also to explore it with us going forward. You can join our online community by finding the Something Weird group on Facebook that we run. That's where we gather together between salons to discuss the topics that come up here. We share links. We connect over our shared love of the weirdest corners of the news. And you can also join us here on the stage. Um, we encourage newbies, even if you don't have mountains of public speaking, the way that it works is that we invite everybody who's interested to join us for brainstormings, and then at every salon, we try to have new speakers. So it is very much an open invitation to get involved. You can find our form online at oddsalon forward slash speak, or you can join our email list from the link on our webpage, and we'll send you the calls for submission that kind of open the door to that. You can also take a piece of Absalon on the road with you in any future trips that you take. 
Our community gave me these pictures of Harvey, who likes to adventure around the world with their cat so that we could stay on theme. And Adventure Harvey is always working on exploring to the ends of the earth and beyond. What's more, if you happen to be like this cat and have some extra funds on hand to support this endeavor called Odd Salon, we want to invite you to get involved and become a patron of the highest order. This year we've rolled out a membership plan as well as a Patreon community and you can join at a level that feels totally reasonable to you to help us keep doing what we're doing here. Uh, not only do you get to have those feel good feels of supporting an endeavor that you feel is important, but you can also get a host of insider benefits from ticket discounts to special events to more odd stories from the Odd Salon speakers and fellows. Just this last month our membership community went out on an outing to the Musée Mécanique and had uh, I like to think a really fun experience of trying to crack open that fascinating space. It was awesome. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, and you can come back and explore the oddest corners of history with us. This is definitely one of the best shows around, in my opinion, and each time I come, I leave with the feeling that my boundaries of the known world have been stretched. So I'd like to raise the first glass of the night to you and to your neighbor, in the crowd, and to our fine speakers, and to cats, because there's more. Meow <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, we also like to start each one of our salons with a little bit of a discussion about the theme. And so my role as a curator, I really wanted to get into how to interpret this really sexy topic and how to choose stories that reflect my ideas about this theme. So I took on a very scientific and discerning approach to <laughs> uncovering that. I asked other people what they thought. <laughs> I surveyed a whole bunch of random folks and asked them all the same question. If I were to ask you for the name of an explorer, who's the first person that comes to mind? So let's try it right now. On the count of three, you're going to yell out the name of a famous explorer. Hey, One. Hey, Good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your enthusiasm. On the count of three. One, two, three. Hey, yeah. Great. I heard every single one. And that was exactly as I expected. When given zero time to think about it, most people offer up answers like these. Christopher Columbus, Ferdinand Magellan, Marco Polo in a swimming pool, <laughs> Captain James Cook, and that makes sense. They're the famous ones, the folks who we were told expanded the horizons of the Western world, the ones who are rich or funded by royalty or had patrons of the highest order, also the ones who made it back, and the ones who had the skills to write books and leave a legacy. And though these guys are certainly pioneers and explorers worthy of naming with no time to consider it, the truth is that I find that definition pretty limiting. Because n it means that all the exploring is done. Once those guys reached those shores, it, the age of exploration in the 15th to 18th century, we checked those boxes. Um, whether it was discovered or discovered, that was it, <laughs> full stop at the end, leaving no, no more to be done by anyone else. And that's kind of sad. So spoiler alert, that's not the night we have planned for you. <laughs> Instead, I'd like to share with you guys a little bit of a story that I think describes a more appropriate definition of exploration. And there's more cats. So. We're going to start with a cat proxy for our main character, because I can't and won't stop. <laughs> this cat is standing in for a fellow named Will, who came up in Germany in the mid-1700s, learning how to play music in his bedroom in Hanover, when at age 19, the seven years more comes along. And instead of sending our young classical rock star to the front line, his parents decided that it was time for him to move away. So he goes to Britain, where he spends the rest of his days. There, his musical works were praised by Beethoven and Haydn and Mozart, but uh, fate had a different plan in mind for him. He definitely started out on the path wanting to learn more about music, so he taught himself some music theory. 
and some of the texts he came across were very math heavy, so he taught himself some higher level math. Yes. Yeah, that's right, Rob. <laughs> that math study let him discover the field of astronomy, and his subsequent obsession with astronomy led Will to be ignited. We'll get to the success part in a moment, I promise, but before we do, I wanna linger for a while on the long and arduous path to greatness that Will finds himself on. Because he doesn't get to be a full-time professional astronomer until he's 43, but he works for his entire life because he is so passionate about this field. In the period of time between 19 and 43, he, he kind of has a side hustle. He's working as a music teacher, a composer, and an organist to play the bills. But all night, every night, he is dedicated to staring up at the sky. On overcast nights, he went so far as to post a, note white, uh, a night watchman who would watch the weather report and keep a weather eye out for the clouds clearing so that he could be woken up in the middle of a rare good night's sleep and check out what's going on in the sky. Will finds that the technology in the mid-1700s to study the skies isn't advanced enough for his liking, and so he decides to uh, devote himself to the books yet again, teaching himself optics and metallurgy and engineering to be able to make his own telescopes. And at one point, he almost kills himself endeavoring to make a 30-foot mirror because the metal casting container is using leaks. It heats up the stone um, flooring where he's doing this experiment. Those um, stones on the floor start ricocheting around the room, and yet our will persists. By finally figuring out how to make his own telescopes properly, he soon had a finer instrument than anyone else in Europe, and he was simply able to see more of the skies. So in 1781, while sweeping the sky with one of these bespoke and customized built telescopes, he spotted a small object that he first took to be either a comet or a nebula star. Will settled on the comet theory and sent his uh, coordinates out to some other astronomers and soon word got back to him that these other scientists had calculated the path of this new thing Will had spotted and decided it was moving in a nearly circular orbit which meant he had discovered a new planet. Planet George, obviously. <laughs> you see, Will was angling for royal patronage and so immediately proposed naming the new object after King George III, the current ruling class of Britain. But continental astronomers weren't so keen on that idea and refused to accept Will's proposed name. So two years later, Planet Uranus is officially added to the annals of history. <laughs> and this, I mean, I, uh, that was a beautiful applause. Thank you, everybody. But the part that blows my mind is this is the first planet that has been discovered past prehistory past um, prehistoric times. Before Will makes this announcement, nobody had any idea that the solar system extended beyond Saturn, because Saturn is the last world that you can see with the naked eye. So this was a huge fucking deal. <laughs> Our man Will, William Herschel, for that's his full name, became famous almost overnight. He was included into the Royal Society of London. He was named the first president of the Royal Astronomical Society when it was founded. He was totally knighted, and the King George flattery worked out, <laughs> for he was rewarded with an annual pension, which allowed him to give up that teaching music business so he could devote himself completely to astronomy. At last, no more sleepless days, only starry nights. More cats. And so the thing that makes Sir William Herschel's story compelling to me on a night like tonight is what it inspired in others. Instead of finding the finite end of discovery, the addition of Uranus ushers in a new age of astronomical exploration. Because at this point, everyone takes to the skies, starting to look for new planets. They all wanted to add their name to the annals in history. In fact, a nerd gang bands together 
they call themselves the Celestial Police, and they officially make an announcement to the skies, watch out, we're coming for you. The next solar system object discovered was Ceres in um, 1801 by Giuseppe Piazzi. Next comes Pallas, Juno, and Vesta. At some point we figure out that they can't all be planets. <laughs> and so a new term called asteroid comes into common parlance. Even still, interest in discovering this new class of celestial object doesn't wane, and ever since that time, asteroids have been discovered almost every year. In our modern times, over 280,000 asteroids have been discovered and mapped, and new ones are found all the time. In fact, there's a private nonprofit foundation based right here in the Bay called B612, and it's named after the asteroid that the Little Prince lived on. <laughs> so they're currently working on funding a privately financed asteroid finding space observatory called the Sentinel Mission, which will likely find a terrifying number of near-Earth objects that could threaten Earth at any point in the future. <laughs> and in this case, discovery led to more discovery and will lead to even more discovery in the future. Exploration begets more exploration and instead of stifling curiosity, it encourages it. And that's the kind of exploring that I'm really excited to revel in tonight with all of you. So every evening we start Odd Salon with an invocation where we turn to someone else's words to frame the show. And tonight I've chosen the words of the inimitable Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> Exploration is what you do when you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> That's what scientists do every day. If a scientist or really an artist or an explorer already knew what they were doing, they wouldn't be discovering anything because they'd already know what they were doing. <laughs> or I think a more succinctly phrased, not all who wander are lost. 